My name is Matt Trudell. I'm an Elixir hacker from Toronto, uh, and I think Philips um, was maybe a bit off the mark with my original one. This actually, Bandit actually started off as a bit of a joke. Um, anybody that wants to find out later or has heard the story, I've talked about it on a few podcasts, but there's a funny backstory about it that I won't get into. Uh, the naming is, I'm big on malapropisms, right? So Bandit is to Cowboy as the library underneath Bandit is called Thousand Island. Bandit is to Cowboy as Thousand Island is to Ranch. Right? Ha, 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 ha. I'm great, I'm, I'm great for those. Um, so I'm going to be talking today about some of the work that I did to enable Phoenix support um, for Bandit and to be able to provide generic web server support within Phoenix, and just kind of some of the happy accidents that came about as a result of that work that are enable new features both in, in Bandit but also within Cowboy as well. So let's talk about Phoenix. 1.7 is a pretty big release. A ton of stuff came out in here. Um, most of these are things that I'm not qualified at all to speak about. The one that I do want to talk about, though, is the fact that Chris mentioned at the end of the blog post the, that announced 1.7 that, uh, Bandit, that, that Phoenix now had first-class web server support. So what that really means is that Phoenix now supports web servers other than Cowboy. It's no longer inextricably tied to Cowboy. It still uses Cowboy as the default web server, but there's nothing really special about Cowboy in that sense. Phoenix shouldn't know, and as of 1.7, actually doesn't know um, kind of what web server it's running on. It's very indifferent to that. And Cowboy becomes essentially just another web server. It just happens to be the default one, but it is just an, another web server that, that, that can power Phoenix. Um, Bandit now, as well, uh, as part of this work, fully supports Phoenix, so there is no more like disclaimer, there's no more asterisk on that. Um, we do, within Bandit, everything that Cowboy does, um, somewhat faster and somewhat more inspectable. We'll talk about that in a bit. And we need two things for this, right? The first thing we need is a generic interface for HTTP. So we need a generic way for a web server to be able to hand off an HTTP connection to an application such as Phoenix. Uh, and we have that today. We've always had that in the form of plug, right? That's, that's what plug is. It's a generic abstraction over HTTP requests and responses. What we didn't have up until 1.7 was an, an analog of Phoenix, uh, of plug rather, but for sockets. Prior to 1.7, Phoenix actually built WebSocket support by reaching in and using Cowboy's internal proprietary specific API for WebSocket support that obviously didn't generalize to, to other servers. So as part of 1.7, we built that. We call it WebSock. Um, it's a library that's maintained along with the companion WebSock adapters library. Uh, they're both supported and maintained uh, via the Phoenix project, so they are first class and will be here for the long haul. And what they essentially do is they provide a generic abstraction over WebSockets. So they provide a server agnostic way for uh, an application such as Phoenix to be able to tie into an underlying web server, web, web socket compliant server. You can think about them in most ways as essentially plug, but for web sockets. Um, that is completely distinct from plug. Uh, the life cycle of a web socket is totally distinct from plug, but they do work in concert to facilitate the upgrade from a, an HTTP connection to a web socket connection. Um, that upgrade is pretty nuanced. It's a bit of a delicate dance, uh, and it's largely facilitated by the web socket adapters library that kind of wraps it all up. And we're going to look at what that upgrade process looks like because it, it kind of, it, at least for me, when I was working through this stuff, it really, that was the light bulb moment for me when I really understood how all of the pieces fit together and WebSockets stopped becoming the sort of just magic thing that just worked. <laughs> to do that, we need to talk about what a WebSocket is. So a WebSocket starts off its life as an HTTP request. In this case, this is the same as any other HTTP request you've seen before. It contains a request line with a verb and a resource, get, so in this case we want to get slash path. It contains some headers. Uh, the things that make an, a WebSocket request, a WebSocket upgrade request, are the fact that it contains two headers, connection upgrade and upgrade WebSocket. This says that the client wants to upgrade the connection and it wants to upgrade that connection to a WebSocket. Uh, there's also some secondary sec-websocket uh, headers that contain some configuration details for the connection. They're not terribly important to understand. Um, but assuming the server, assuming that the connection checks out, that slash path is a resource that it is willing to upgrade to a WebSocket, will return, again, what looks an awful lot like an HTTP response. Uh, the key difference here is that instead of a 200 OK or a 404 not found, it returns a 101 switching protocols. Uh, the 100 series of response codes are those that are given um, with the intent to keep the connection open. Uh, you may have seen these for like sort of allowing more data. They're generally ones that are sort of um, intermediary within, within a longer lived connection. 
And again, it returns some headers that says that it was willing to upgrade the connection and that it's willing to upgrade the connection to a WebSocket, again, with some details. And at this point, this connection is now a WebSocket. Uh, you can now send either end, either the client or the server, is free to send frames in either direction uh, in an asynchronous manner. There's no sort of request response structure to it. Um, they all just sort of work asynchronously at their leisure in either direction. So the key thing to note here is that at least the first part of this looks an awful lot like plug, right? It's an HTTP request. It has some headers. It has a verb. It has a, it has a, 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 a path that it's being requ requested to. And the response looks a lot like plug. Um, and in fact, within the way, that we've, the way that we solved this, we actually do protocol upgrades into WebSockets um, via plug. And the, 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 the structure that we've built for this, um, thanks to Jose for kind of really pushing me on, on refining this interface. Um, actually supports upgrades to other protocols as well. So th there aren't any at the moment, but if HTTP ever uh, does any upgrades to other protocols, we, we just transparently support that. So let's look at how this actually manifests in a plug application today. So again, we have a request that comes in, requ the client requesting an update. We surface this into an application via a regular plug call. So this, in the case of Phoenix, will just get plumbed through the router the same as any HTTP request does. And it looks just like a call. It's, it is a call. It is a plug. It's an HTTP request at this point. It has a plug.con structure that represents it. It looks and acts exactly like a plug, because it is a plug. Um, the key thing that, upgrade, that, that, that we now facilitate upgrades with is there's, as of plug.1.14, we've added uh, this upgrade adapter function uh, to the plug.con along with send resp and, and, um, you know, se and um, send resp headers, set resp headers, and all those other um, functions. We now have this upgrade adapter function um, that indicates some pretty, the, the plumbing within plug is purposely kind of dumb. There's not a lot of smarts here. It's purposely very abstract. Um, and so we'll, we wrap that up as I'll, I'll show you in just a moment. But in this case, this essentially says that we want the underlying server to upgrade this connection to a WebSocket using the information in that tuple at the end to describe what the upgrade looks like. We'll talk about the details in just a moment. So at this point, the underlying web server, and at this point, the life cycle of the connection transitions over to the WebSock behavior. And so um, when I mentioned in this part here, you actually typically don't use the plug.con.upgradeadapter directly. You use websockadapter.upgrade because there's, it's not super important, there's a little bit of subtlety to it, but websockadapter.upgrade is what people will use. It just calls that other function under the hood after doing a, a bit of work um, to set things up. And in this case, we'll say that we want to upgrade this connection to a websocket using the my with 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 using the my websock module as the implementing behavior of the websock uh, behavior as the implementing module for the websock behavior and then we want to pass in some initial state to this uh, and then so the websock behavior that is then that then sort of takes over that life cycle looks like this it has it looks an awful lot like a gen server uh, because at least in the case of bandit it actually is a, a gen server it's implemented as a gen server um, it has an init function that's called once the connection is established this lets you nail up some initial behavior if you want to for example subscribe to a pub sub um, interface or something or a pub sub channel internally once the connection's up it has a handle in function that is called whenever the client sends messages to the server, uh, contains the message and the state, and uh, some other ancillary messages for methods for calling, uh, for taking Erlang messages, for handling control frames from the client. And all of these have the very, you know, the, the, the idiomatic gen server pattern of sort of taking a state and returning a state. So they're very easy and familiar patterns to be able to keep a life cycle of a connection going within your code. So let's look at what this looks like. So here I have um, a very simple, this is just a simple script, so I'm just using mix install for this. So I'm installing plug and WebSock adapter and Bandit, uh, and I have this simple plug definition down here um, that's just a plug using the plug.router. Uh, this is all just essentially built into plug. At the, the root, I have a, a get matcher that just returns this little text block. This is mostly just so that we can copy and paste this inside the browser. I seem to have lost my mouse. We had a bit of AV difficulties earlier, and I can't seem to, oh, there it is, okay. Um, and then we have this, this, this the guy here, which is kind of the magic, right? This accepts the slash WebSocket um, URL and calls WebSocket app that upgrade with the connection, saying I want to use this upcase server module uh, with no initial state and just a timeout of 60 seconds as a, as a connection parameter. And finally, we just start this up uh, as a bandit server, specifying that plug. Uh, 
upcase server is implemented here. The really interesting, the only interesting part here is that we have this handle in function uh, that takes a message in, passes the text of that message through string.upcase and returns that back to the client. So really the behavior here is that we'd expect if we pass a message, a WebSocket message from a client to the server, we expect to get back that exact same message, just uppercase, just kind of to, re to, to represent the entire lifecycle. And so if I grab this and I paste this into an IEX session, and I'm now running on Fort 4000, so if I go to localhost and run this, I get, ignore the message in the background, it's trying to find the fav icon, um, but the, the big thing here, hopefully I didn't make that too big, I'm having a really hard time finding my mouse, so please bear with me. There it is. We're gonna copy that, we're gonna open up Inspector. Hopefully, can everybody see the Inspector? Is that big enough? Okay, great. So I paste that in, I've now connected to the client, I've now connected to the server, and I can now send, this is from within the browser, I can send a BCDEFG, and I get back right away a message with the uppercase string, A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Right, so this is kind of the simplest, this is like the, 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 the WebSock version of Hello World, right? This is sort of the simplest um, WebSock implementation you can build, but the cool thing is that this gives you, like if you've ever used Plug for anything lower level, this gives you that same sort of power and expressiveness, but for WebSocket connections. So to put it all together, to kind of review what we just saw, we've defined this new WebSOC um, behavior that essentially just defines a really simple, very gen server-like API for what a WebSocket handler might look like. Uh, we've added support for plug, purposely sort of, air quotes, dumb support uh, to be able to facilitate upgrades. This works for WebSockets today, but it will also work for any new protocols that might happen to come along. We have this WebSock adapter library that kind of takes all these pieces and makes them easy to use. Um, and we have support for Bandit and Cowboy. Uh, Bandit supports this natively. Cowboy supports it via a shim in WebSock adapter. Uh, that's actually one of the main reasons that we want you to use WebSock adapter instead of plug.con.upgrade adapter. Um, so what does this mean for Phoenix? Well, the big thing now is that Phoenix Web Huntsman's web support, WebSocket support, is entirely based on this. This, this is what Phoenix uses. Um, you can actually see this if you look at Lib Phoenix Transport's uh, WebSocket. Um, it's literally just a plug call function that does more or less exactly what we just saw and calls, an, calls a websock adapter.upgrade. That, that is how Phoenix does websockets. So there's no more cowboy specific stuff in, in Phoenix. There is for startup, we're working on that, but at least for the purposes of what happens once the server is running, it's entirely generic within, within, web, within Phoenix. So this means that any plug or websock compatible server can now host Phoenix. Uh, WebSock adapter provides support for Cowboy today, so everything that we've seen here will just work for you. In fact, if you're running 1.7, you're running this today. You probably don't even know it, but you're running the stack today. Uh, Bandit is plug and WebSock native. Uh, plug and WebSock are the APIs that, ben that Bandit uses, so of course it just works with this. And the end result of this is that from end to end, we now have a fully API-based, fully sort of um, well-specified interface to be able to host uh, applications such as Phoenix that use both HTTP and WebSockets. So which difference does this make for you, right? It's cool that Phoenix uses this, that's great. It's mostly just plumbing at this point for most people. The key realization here is that WebSocket upgrades are 100% plug mediated, right? If we looked at that example that we just saw, that we saw previously, um, the line where we started the server just, just specified the plug. We didn't specify anything about the WebSockets we wanted to run, right? The, de the decision about what WebSocket we want to upgrade, what WebSocket handler we wanted to upgrade to is entirely dynamic, it's entirely done at runtime, uh, and it's entirely up to you as a developer. So you have a lot more freedom with that, and that freedom actually enables some pretty cool things, right? The first of those is that WebSocket handlers can now live anywhere inside Phoenix's router. So you can, whereas previously we've had to, we've been constrained to having socket lines in the endpoint. Um, most people never need to see these, but if you've set things up like OBAN dashboards or, um, I don't think live dashboard does it anymore, but it used to require, I think, a, special, a separate line. And the really cool thing is that you can write your own WebSocket handlers. And this is really useful if you want to use Phoenix to sort of strangle out an existing backend and replace your backend server, but not necessarily use all of Phoenix's view structure. Maybe you just want to replace an existing WebSocket server with Phoenix, and you just want to have all that power and expressiveness, but you're constrained about what the, the actual protocol that you, that you throw back and forth over WebSockets looks like. Um, this used to be sort of possible in Phoenix. It was a lot of work to get there. Um, uh, Paul was actually talking about this yesterday with uh, the FedEx project. Um, those implementations server-side now become almost trivial. 
And we're going to look at one of those what one of those looks like. So in here, I've got this is an absolute like the I literally just ran phx.new no ecto on this. Um, I'm just not doing it now because I don't trust the I don't trust the Wi-Fi. Um, but I'm going to start up a server here. Whoops. Just start up a server here. And you'll notice this is an out-of-the-box application. So this is running on Cowboy. I haven't changed this to Bandit. Everything that I've talked about so far, everything that I'm going to be talking about today, runs both on Cowboy and on Phoenix. Right? This is this is a complete one-for-one. Um, -one. Bandit is a complete replacement. Everything works in both of them. And so now, whoops, if I, I'm just going to do a bit of screen wizardry here. If I go and I look at my router, and I'm going to add one little line to this router. In my, my main pipeline here, I'm going to add a line that says git slash WebSocket. And it's going to go to this WebSocket controller, which we're then going to go and implement. I'm just going to paste these values in here. This is that one. This is a totally out of the box, completely unsurprising Phoenix controller. right? It uses, it pulls in demo web controller. Uh, it has a deaf web socket that takes a connection. It is in every way a regular Phoenix controller. We're going to use the same web socket adapter that upgrade that we've seen before, and we're going to subscribe. We're going to upgrade to this simple pub sub client function um, module rather, and we're going to pass in just for argument's sake the parameters from the request. In point of fact, you could pull in anything from the connection here. You could extract things from the session. You could do whatever you'd like to do to be able to pass some initial state over to your web socket. But for the purposes of our demo. We're just going to take the parameters from the request. We're going to pass in a simple definition. Oh, shoot. Oh, boy. God, I say this in every talk that I do that VI is not the right tool. All right. <laughs> so we're going to have this simple little definition here. Um, Again, if you were doing this uh, in a serious capacity, you would have this in a separate module in its own namespace. But again, for the sake of argument, for the sake of demonstration, we have the simple pub sub client. The init call that's called this is called once the once the web socket connection is live, once it's been set up, um, takes the arguments, grabs a name parameter out of them, and just subscribes to uh, the built-in pub sub uh, the, the built-in Phoenix pub sub system using that name. Uh, and then we have this handle info that we can then pass messages to. Um, that, that this is passed. This is called by PubSub with a message, and we push that message in this case as a text frame out to the client. And so now, um, if I go back to, you're also going to have to bear with me because I literally changed this demo to do this this morning. So I might live to regret that. We'll see. So if I go back here and I look here, we're now at the Phoenix page that we just had. Um, I'm going to paste in that same sock line before, but I'm just going to add a parameter here, name. Matt, right? So I've connected at this point, and if I go back here to my um, back to my my IEX session, and I paste in this guy, which is just going to broadcast to the the pub sub channel to the, the 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 user Matt, which is the one that I just registered with, just the string hey there, and if I go back to my browser, we have hey there. So this is kind of cool, right? Because we have the full power and expressiveness and ever, all the goodies that are inside Phoenix. We have access to Ecto. We have access to PubSub. We have access to all of the, if you want to do rendering, you have access to all of the templating stuff in there. Um, but you can also define at the lowest level you'd ever need to exactly what message, what bytes you're sending back and forth on the wire over WebSockets. So this is hugely useful if you need to be able to do, like again, like a strangler pattern to replace an existing backend with Phoenix. Um, it also means that add-ons like Oban and Live Dashboard can be totally self-contained, right? Because upgrades are sort of plumbed through the, the Phoenix router. You don't need to have anything special in your endpoint configuration for any of these things to work. If they need to do a WebSocket upgrade, they can facilitate that themselves. Uh, and this is the big one for me personally, is that Cowboy is now kind of just one among many possible web servers, right? Bandit and Cowboy are completely... Um, uh, they have complete parity in all respects, uh, but the next one, the next person that wants to write whatever the next malapropism name is for it, for the next web server, the, lift, the, the work's already done, right? Being able to come up with a third one is already there. The abstractions have already been built. I'd be in remiss after having done all this work, though, I think, if 
because I did all of this, of course, because I wanted to make Bandit work with, with Phoenix, if I didn't kind of give an update on Bandit. Um, so for anyone who hasn't necessarily heard of it, which is probably a lot of you, uh, it's a fully Elixir web server that I've been writing over the past couple of years or so, has a bunch of really cool things on the cell sheet that make it a pretty compelling option, to alternative to Cowboy. Um, one of the big ones that's not on here that I've actually come to realize from talking to people today is the fact that because the way the process model works, everything, for at least for HTTP 1 and for WebSocket connections in Bandit, it is a gen server, and it's entirely run inside a single process per connection. So if you throw a stack frame inside Phoenix, you see the entire stack frame all the way out to the socket. There's no kind of... You often see this with Ecto, for example, when you'll get a stack trace and it has some stuff from an Ecto process that's running in a, in a pool somewhere and it doesn't necessarily help you narrow down to where the problem is. Kind of by construction, every stack trace that you'll get out of Bandit, just because of the way it's architected and the simplicity of it, um, will help you nail down exactly where the error might be. Um, so to talk about kind of what the road came to look like to, to get to where we are today with Bandit, I first talked about it in October 21 at um, ElixirCon North America. Uh, that's where I had the first public release for it. Uh, in May 2022, I announced HTTP-only support, so basically plug-based support for Phoenix within Bandit. Um, earlier, or late last year, uh, I worked for a pretty intense month or so with Jose and, um, and Gasler and a few folks on the, the plug and Phoenix teams uh, to figure out what WebStock looked like and to release that both for Bandit and also the implementations on top of Cowboy. Uh, this was like in the like the week before Phoenix 1.7 uh, came out, so it was pretty hectic. Uh, and thanks to thanks to those guys for helping with that. That was hugely. Um, it wouldn't happen without them. Uh, and since then, I've taken the earlier parts of this year within Bandit. Uh, to do, uh, do some comprehensive performance improvements on it. Uh, we have a really rich uh, performance regression suite that runs as part of CI, has some nice graphs and stuff, so we can see performance regressions when they happen. Uh, so it should stay fast for, for the long haul. Um, refined some of the issues with telemetry and added a ton of configuration knobs to the project so that you can configure just about anything you'd ever want to. And so I find myself here in April uh, in sunny Lisbon with not a whole lot left to do. So I did what anybody would do in that situation, and I made some logos and some stickers for the project. <laughs> right? A project's not real until it has a logo. Uh, I've got stickers. They're downstairs on the table. If anybody sees me on the table at the, uh, the sign-in table, uh, if anybody sees me, I've got a bunch in my pocket. I'm happy to hand them out. They're cute little stickers. Um, courtesy of Midjourney, by the way. This is like the future's wild AI-generated AI -generated logos. Uh, the other big news, though, is that Bandit 1.0 pre starts today. Um, there's really nothing left to do that isn't that that's going to run the risk of breaking any of the the contracts that we have with users. Um, so about an hour ago, I tagged 1.0.0 pre one, uh, and I also tagged a similar one for Thousand Island. So if anyone is Thousand Island is the sort of the lower level TCP library that sits underneath Bandit. Uh, I also tagged a 1.0 of that. So if anyone's using Thousand Island or Bandit, uh, you can just use these refs and start pulling in the 1.0 pre series. Uh, I hope to land a final 1.0 sometime by the summer, maybe June, depending on how many bugs come out of this, which there inevitably will be. Um, Bandit fully supports 1.7. Anything that doesn't work uh, for any Phoenix is beyond 1.7 is a bug, uh, and, should, and I'll treat it as such. It should, it, it, there shouldn't be any issue to doing an upgrade. Switching to Bandit is a one-line change. Um, you can see the Bandit readme for details. It's mostly just a matter of pulling in the dependency and adding adapter colon bandit.phoenix adapter to your config file. So what about the future, right? Having a 1.0, I've now, you know, sort of, com I'm compelled to not change the API, but there's still some changes to be made. Uh, there's a couple of really deeply obscure RFCs that I want to implement, uh, mostly around uh, WebSocket upgrades from HTTP2 uh, and a couple of other really obscure corners, uh, a few things with like header compression in HTTP2, really small, niggly stuff. Nothing super important at all. Nothing that nine, that anybody in this room would care about, but I just kind of want to do for completion's sake. Um, there's probably going to be some changes to Phoenix's preferred structure for doing socket upgrades. Now that we can facilitate them through the router, um, they'll probably be a little more visible and a little more uh, easily surfaced to controllers to be able to use. Still figuring out exactly what that looks like. Kind of only really got consensus on the general idea yesterday, so uh, we'll see what that looks like. Um, in the distant future, HTTP 3 support, web transport support, uh, and just general quick support uh, is hopefully going to be a thing. This is, a, for a bunch of technical reasons, a, a really big undertaking uh, with a ton of dependencies. 
I'm not entirely sure how this is going to shake out in terms of responsibilities between this might even be like an Erlang core concern for, for quick. I'm not sure yet. Um, but this will be for I get this question a lot. And the answer is it's coming probably, but don't hold your breath because it's going to be a while just because it's a ton of work. That's all I had. Uh, links are here to the, the repo to if you go to the, the talks, my talks repo, the slides for this are up there or they will be in like 20 minutes or so. Um, there's a bandit and Thousand Island channel on the Elixir Slack and you can also hit me up on email or anytime in the rest of the talk and at the conference rather. Thanks for listening. Thanks for putting this on. Thanks to Philip. Thanks for listening. Yeah, look at that. Five minutes. So we have time for two or three questions. Do we have any questions here in the room? Just a reminder for the people following us on the stream, you can also ask questions on the conference app. But any questions here in the room? Yes. Uh, thank you for your work on that. It's really cool. Um, so my question is that you have a, a claim of four times improvement over um, Cowboy for HTTP 1.1. So I'm kind of curious, like, have you sort of ran this in any like um, huge production load? Or is that like a local benchmark? So the, the short answer to that, and I'm, I'm YOLOing this, so hopefully this works. Um, there's a really comprehensive performance suite that runs as part of CI um, that has like a, a reproducible um, set of benchmarks that we run against. So I can compare different versions of Bandit to each other. I can compare branches. I can compare against Cowboy. Um, and generally speaking, so this is, the, this is the salient point right here. Oops, I probably shouldn't have done that. Hopefully you can see that. This is essentially the number of the, the, the performance increase of Bandit over Cowboy uh, correlating to the number of clients. This is running on a GitHub Actions CI instance. So there's two cores in it. And you can see this peaks at two cores. Uh, I've run this similar package, this exact same benchmark on like I booted up a like a 32 core DigitalOcean box that was like $20 a minute and um, ran this on there and it was the exact same shit, the exact same graph with a peak at 32. So it seems to be, I'm not, I'm not a benchmarker, I'm, this is, these are frankly pretty unscientific, um, but it seems to correlate pretty strongly to the size of the box rather than to the number of clients. They both deal pretty well with clients, I think, like with client scale, it's mostly the band that does a better job of using the resources available than Cowboy does. Thank you, Matt. We have time for maybe one more question. Do I have another question here? Thank, thank you, Matt. Um, <clears throat> you showed some examples with the uh, WebSock, uh, WebSock adapter. Mm -hmm. uh, does it also come with some behavior so you don't have to implement all the like things like init or terminate? There's, uh, I, there's only five functions defined on it. Um, four of them are mandatory. Handle control is the only one that's optional. Um, init, you, in practice, you actually use almost everywhere, it seems to be. So we kept that one just because it's super common. It, handle in, it, similarly, super common. Handle info, um, not used super often. Like I use it in this example, but not super often. And then terminate is, is, is it probably should be optional. Um, and in fact, that's a, that's a good point. We probably could make it optional. But there is o there's only five callbacks in the entire behavior. So it's not, a, it's not a huge space. And these in practice, I think, aren't things you're going to be writing very often. But I mean, that's not to say that there's no, that's not an excuse for it not being ergonomic. And I think that's something we could probably do. Thanks for that. Thank you for your question. Then please give another huge round of applause for Matt Trudell. Okay.